Today I'm sitting down with Ken Williams for the first episode of the podcast and just want to give the audience a little bit of your background, how you got to gardening, what you're currently working on right now maybe. All right, um, yeah, background, I grew up, grew up in the suburbs of Denver, Colorado. My dad landscaped our yard, my sister grew food. Um, I think the first time she brought a kohlrabi into the house was kind of when I went, Wow, this growing stuff is something. Um, I'd never never heard of such a thing. And um, really, I've pretty much grown food ever since then, everywhere I've ever lived. Um, that was my, you know, although I did yard work as a kid, I growing food is what got me interested in gardening. And then, um, well, I guess it was in the 90s, I'd been living in, in southeast Kansas in a small town, growing a lot of food and doing various jobs. And um, happened to get a job at a local um, city park. And a couple years later, the horticulture position came open. And I had never occurred to me that you could get paid for, to be a gardener. But um, I worked there for 16 years and just did whatever I want to, pretty much. As long as I kept, it kept getting prettier, people, you know, didn't mind how weird it was what I was doing because... I rejected a lot of the stuff they'd been traditionally doing. They had a lot of shrubs that were cut into these contrived shapes, and you couldn't believe how much time we wasted cutting those back um, over and over and over. And so when I got control of the program, I just took a tractor and a log chain and pulled those suckers out of the ground and replaced them with things that um, I could let, let grow the way they wanted to grow. Um, I didn't have to make them grow the way I wanted them to grow. It freed up so much time that the place became beautiful. Um, I was back there for a wedding. You know, it's been 12 years since I lived there, but I was back there for a wedding recently, and I met somebody who I I knew her husband, and I'd known of her, um, and she's a big-time gardener in the area, and, you know, she said, Oh, you're Kenny used to work at the park. Well, you're legendary. Because, you know, because I really made an impact. After I left, they pretty much went back to more conventional methods, and they ran out of manpower. And and when I go there, people say, oh, Ken, don't go. You don't want to see it. I, I really don't know what it looks like. But I moved here, and my wife, Christine Nye, was a horticulturist at the Shedd Aquarium. We met through a zoo horticulture organization because we had a zoo at the park where I worked in Kansas. And um, zoos include aquariums, so we met through that organization. I moved here 12 years ago and, um, you know, got involved with people who were do, working specifically, who, who had embraced the, what we call the gospel according to Doug Tallamy, um, which is that um, we need to use our landscapes to feed insects in one way or another, because insects are such an important link in the chain between the plant kingdom. You know, this, the sun goes to all this work to send this energy all the way from the sun to here. These plants take that energy, convert it into chemical energy, and then our idea in landscaping is that it should just sit there, and we should look at it and be thankful. And in fact, that's just a step in the process. The next step is for insects to eat it, and then for bigger things to eat the insects. And what Talamy zeroed in on is the fact that most songbirds feed their babies mostly caterpillars, and caterpillars are mostly very host specific. Uh, people know about monarchs and milkweed. That monarch caterpillars can't eat anything but milkweed, but most um, caterpillars are specific to, to some degree or another and um, so we have to be aware of that and to provide not just butterflies and moths and caterpillars um, but also all kinds of bees and different kinds of pollinating plants we have to provide for all of them we can't just take them for granted and when we grow lawns um, you know lawn is something that the the British landed aristocracy, you know, decide 
you know, everybody knew what a sheep pasture looked like. It was pretty, you know, and then people, because it was grazed down nice and smooth and it had a diversity of different things growing in it. And then these guys came up with the idea, like, I own so much land that I don't even need to put sheep on it. I can pay some fool to cut it for me. Well, he's not a fool. He's a servant. He's trying to feed his family. But um, I can pay this guy to cut it for me instead of using it to feed my family. And, um, and so it became a status symbol. And then when, they, when, when everybody had that, you couldn't show off with that, then they came up with the idea, you know, hedging trees, shrubs into hedges for different reasons was a, had been something people had done for thousands of years to produce poles, to produce wood for charcoal, to do all kinds of different things, cutting back woody plants over and over for the purpose of letting them grow. Well, these guys came up with the idea of, I have so much labor, so many servants, that I can just send them out to cut this stuff back over and over and over and over and completely waste this resource just to show off how wasteful I can be. And that's where we got basically our conventional landscape standards from people just showing off uh, that they had the ability to be wasteful. And that was okay once upon a time, but we can't afford to just be wasteful intentionally anymore. We have to use our landscapes to feed things um, or everybody's going to starve. It's not just the insects. It's just not the songbird. It's all of us. That was a great answer. Um, it definitely answered my first question of how we got to the current state of landscaping as it stands today with the nice cured, manicured lawns, the contrived shapes of, these, of the shrubs that we see mostly in traditional landscapes. What I was wondering also, you said that it's now that we need to include, you know, native plants, plants that help bees, butterflies, um, you know, caterpillars. Um, in our in our yard and you know one argument that I could hear is that you know people say oh we have plenty of room in our national parks and our forest preserves and our nature preserves to you know that's where the nature belongs that's where that's where we blocked it off to is there so why why should we bring native plants and ecological landscaping into our yards well for one thing these plants that we brought here so that they wouldn't feed anything they don't stay in our yards. Go to some of our natural areas, anywhere around the Chicago area, and the majority of them are a disaster because they're invaded by honeysuckle, by burning bush, by barberry and, um, and buckthorn, of course, and, you know, that are wiping out all the native vegetation. And we really don't have, there are some beautiful natural areas around here, don't get me wrong, there are some fantastic ones, but there are limited resources for maintaining these, and the people who do the work have to focus on their highest quality sites. And a lot of these sites, you know, they'll bring in a ficon mower that mows everything to the, all the woody invasives to the ground, you know, once every 10 or 15 years, they get a grant to do that, and, and they mow everything down and then everything sprouts back and they don't have the time to follow up. They don't have the resources. It's, you know, in these natural areas, there, there are some great ones. We were just talking earlier about Bellaria Meadows here in McHenry County that's so fantastic and it's been, it's been maintained and it, it stayed good, but so many of them. But in your yard, you have the opportunity to be responsible a responsible steward of just that little piece of paradise that you own. Um, and, you know, so do it. Just, you know, don't just, you know. And like we were talking about lawns, you know, when I was a kid, I remember my dad explaining to me the importance of um, clover growing in a lawn. And everybody understood that. But this is back, you know, in the 50s the late 50s, um, and then, you know, the first time that the the Masters Golf Tournament was broadcast in color from Augusta National, and people saw lawn that had been chemically treated and didn't have clover on it, they said, ooh, 
And then the chemical industry jumped right in. And now we don't even feed bees with our lawns. That's crazy. Um, you know, that, 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 that was an unheard of thing not that long ago. Um, and from all the time from when the British aristocracy invented lawn, you know, lawns were a diversity of things. And now it's just this green carpet that's dead, basically. It doesn't allow water to infiltrate. It'll, water running through it will get filtered a little bit, but it doesn't allow water to, to percolate into the ground. It's almost as impervious as concrete in that respect. It doesn't sequester carbon like our deep-rooted native plants will do. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that our native plants will, will provide for us. Um, that, and, you know, we need to sequester carbon uh, if anybody... If you haven't heard about that, it is something that's going on. And, um, and we need to keep water from running off of everywhere and flooding everybody downstream. We need to hold it on our property and put it in the ground where it belongs. So it here in McHenry County, every drop of tap water comes from the aquifers. Down around Joliet, it's not the case because their aquifers have dried up. Mm. And we have to you know, behave more responsibly around here. And, and just having a few little forest preserves and stuff, <coughs> wonderful as they are, isn't going to be enough. I don't think it's not going to be enough, especially if they're not, not every conservation district or forest preserve, you know, they operate on a limited budget and it would be nice if they would have all the money and the resources to be able to eradicate invasives, at, you know, at a relatively, you know, stable rate. But at some points it just gets out of hand and the invasives take over. And then what you're looking at when you go to a forest preserve is just these, you know, you see these tall trees, but then you just see an understory of just foreboding, buckthorn, honeysuckle. You can't really hear any birds or anything. You don't see anything flying anywhere because it's not where they're not normalized that that's not where they want to live. So that's a big problem. That's why we need to bring, you know, ecological landscaping. We need to bring native plants into our landscape. Um, if we just take care of our little piece of land, and everybody decides to do the same thing, you know, we can make a big difference when it comes to conserving species and conserving insects for other species to feed on. So that's why I'm such a big proponent, and as well as Ken is such a big proponent of native landscaping. And I just want to go back to, you were comparing having a, a manicured lawn to having a nice native garden. And, you know, some people might be intimidating by the fact that traditional landscaping, all you have to do is spray chemical down, water it sometimes, mow the lawn. I guess I just want you to compare the maintenance levels with the native garden compared to a traditional landscape. Yeah, you know, a lot of that is in the design, in how it's done in the first place, how you arrange the plants. There are, there are different ways. Um, my friend Sarah McHale, who works with um, the Land Conservancy of McHenry County, we just went to her house yesterday and she, in her backyard, has been converting lawn to prairie with seed. Um, and she has a place that's the second year since she did it. And she has an area that it's the fifth year that she did it. And the fifth year place is really pretty. The second year place is, it's a lot of uh, black-eyed Susans. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, they come up fast and they grow fast. And she puts a lot into this original seed mix. So it's pretty, but the diversity in the other. And she, you know, that's what she does in the evening. She goes out and she walks around and she finds the wrong thing. She pulls it out. It's not much work. It's quieter. You know, she's never sitting on a lawnmower in these places. She still has lots of lawn. But around in the front of the house, she has very formal native plantings that are all, all straight species natives. She's got the ground covered with cool season ground cover native plants like um, prairie smoke and like our native violets, violets soror soria, and it's the native weedy violets, but they're great. They're easy to weed out if you decide you don't want them, but they cover ground. And when you have the ground covered early in the season, then that's when the weeds are germinating. And if the ground's already covered, there's already something there, then the weeds don't have anywhere to germinate. Weed seeds need sunlight 
to germinate, and that's why we use mulch. But the problem with mulch is, for one thing, none of our plants co-evolved in it. For another thing, um, it doesn't last. Tree seeds, you know, Melissa and I used to work together maintaining mulched gardens all over, you know, the Fox River Grove, Cary area. And, you know, we spent most of our time killing, or a lot of our time, killing little baby trees, uh, buckthorn trees and different things. They would come up a solid carpet of trees on top of the mulch because, you know, the mulch doesn't, isn't going to prevent them. And, but if you're, if you're growing this green, carpet of um, different cool season plants and then with bigger things in between them to give you more you know a, a continuation of bloom and interest throughout the season if you really want to understand how to do this as well as anybody's figured it out you need to read the book called planting in the post wild world by thomas Rainier and claudia west these people are a lot smarter than me and have figured it out. Doug Tallamy calls it the universal how-to guide to sustainable landscaping we have all been waiting for. And that's quite a statement, and it's completely accurate because they've formally figured it out. I know properties where people have stumbled into this, covering the ground with cool season plants and then having bigger stuff grow up through it. Um, a lot of gardeners have figured this out but never really figured out the words to go with it, which is what I love about Thomas and Claudia is that they do know the words to go with it to explain how to do this as well as possible. But, you know, as far as how much maintenance it is, I'm not going to tell you that it's, it's no work. It is work, but for one thing, it's much quieter. You're not burning fuel. You're not running... You know, my neighbor over here, he has a beautiful landscape. He's a, he's a hardscaper and does beautiful work. He has a, the, the pizza oven and, and all that stuff and a lot of flowers growing in pots. And it's, it's really gorgeous. And there's barely a day goes by that I'm not listening to his blower, you know, because he's, he's always, I don't know what it, he's blowing, but he's always running. He's always got one machine or another going over there. And go out in a residential neighborhood, you know? I mean, open your window, take a listen. There's always machinery running, and there doesn't have to be. We it, These, these uh, especially the two-cycle machines we use for, for blowers and weed whackers and stuff, they're incredibly inefficient. The amount of pollution they put out, uh, there are numbers, you can look them up. You know, it's like driving halfway across the United States to mow a lawn. You know, it's bad stuff. We need to quit doing it. It, it's not just that it's less work. It is less work, but it's so much better work. Spraying chemicals. To my lawn right here that we're sitting in is full of creeping charlie. You know? And it's work for me to keep it from growing out into all the gardens. But uh, I tried to kill it one time with vinegar. Had really good luck one time and then tried it again and didn't have good luck. So You know, that was a great description of maintenance and how it relates to a traditional landscape. Um, I think it's just a lot more rewarding, too, when you see the butterflies and different types of bees oh. and dragonflies. How rewarding. You told me earlier that you had, I mean, there's a little hummingbird I see right now sitting on top of a dead tree, and it is just a wonderful image. And that's not, you know, an everyday um, occurrence, what people see in their traditional landscape. And so I think it's a lot more rewarding when we plant um, native plants, use ecological landscaping, because it feels good to do it. And if you want to, if you think about the environmental consequences of mowing the lawn, using all that gas, applying fertilizers that will get into our watershed at one point, end up in a stream, and affect, you know, different levels of the food chain. If you just think about the environmental consequences and how much input you have to put into a traditional landscape compared to a native landscape, I mean, it's a no-brainer of what we... If, we really care about the environment. Yeah, and water. And water you know. as well. Um, you know, our our yard, the only input, our yard has two, three inputs. One is labor, one is plants, and the other is our neighbor's leaves. When our neighbor puts their leaves out on the curb, we go pick them up, and I dump them out in the driveway and mow them up with a lawnmower, and I use that to a certain degree as mulch. We do not put any 
you know, all those things on the shelves, maybe we should just say big box store or any box store, anything you've ever seen advertised on TV for using in your yard, we've never used any of those things. Our, you know, people say, oh, well, we you need to fertilize. I mean, what are the plants going to live on? Look, when the last glacier retreated, this place was a rubble pile. By the time Europeans came here, 15,000 years later, there was the richest soils in the world. Plants did that. Nobody came in with a spray rig. Nobody came in and dumped piles of compost. Um, the plants did that all by themselves by growing these long fibrous roots and then every winter the herbaceous plants every winter the the, the fibrous roots dying back and leaving all that organic matter in the ground sequestering carbon and building this soil this this incredible you know heartland of america landscape was built completely by the plants there, there's you don't need anything off the shelf to make this work and if you get outbreaks of insects that cause you problems just chill out you know it's it's going to be okay i do one of the things i do for recreation these days is i do take a bowl with soapy water and catch uh japanese beetles off the flowers of my lead plant and my queen of the prairie you just put the bowl underneath and shake the flower and the, the, the bugs all fall off into the uh, water and drown so i do use a little bit of dish soap in my landscape so i guess i was incorrect but but you don't need any of those products. And for lawn, you know, generally, by most standards, you need all kinds of things. You know, I had just today, I had my next-door neighbor ask me, do you have a plant over there that makes the mosquitoes go away? Because in the evening, you know, when the mosquitoes come out and we all go out in the house, we look over and you guys are still sitting out. And right now, probably most of our neighbors have gone in the house because the mosquitoes are eating them up. I don't claim to know why, you know, we do have dragonflies over here, but I very seldom have problems with the mosquito in our yard. And I've worked in a lot of places with standing water and lush vegetation where I go day after day and I don't encounter mosquitoes the way people complain about. But yeah, you, you, it saves you, you know, you just don't, you know, I know, I realize people like to buy things, but you don't, you know, to have a lush productive landscape you, you don't need to be going to the store mostly i have people come by and they said oh your yard is beautiful i said i tell them well you can have one like this too and they said oh no you know all i do when i when i try to grow plants i just kill them and i said good that's what i mostly do i spend i don't put any effort into growing plants i put all my effort into killing other things um killing plants uh <coughs> you know I call it a godlike power. I get to kill what I want and leave the rest. We were at our friend Sarah's the other day, and she has this beautiful planting along the front of her house. Between the sidewalk and the house, just that narrow strip, it's all native violets and great big, beautiful little blue stem, big, beefy blue ones. And there's not a single plant there that she planted. They just wandered in from other places in her yard, the little blue stems are nice and evenly spaced across underneath the picture window in front of her house um, and all filled in underneath them with violets and all she's ever done there is remove plants she's never put anything in there on her own you know you work with the plants you know walk in alpine tundra or in a or in a pristine prairie go over to chiwaki prairie which is largest uh, prey remnant in the state of Wisconsin. It's right on the Illinois border, hits um, Lake Michigan, and you go there, you'll find this incredible prairie. Go see how the plants are mixed together in that place, or in a prairie, or drive through the hills in Wisconsin when the leaves are changing, either in the spring or fall, and you see how the compositions, how the different trees are blended together. Nobody did that. It, it just it worked out on its own and it's gorgeous. So if anybody um, looks at this video physically on YouTube instead of just listening to the audio, they could see an image of Ken's front yard right now, um, and it is just amazing. And so my next question is, if someone you know enjoys this view and wants to plant native plants in their yard, what do you suggest they do? Where do they go for these native plants? 
Um, more and more communities have native plant societies. There are wild ones chapters all over the place. There are great, great resources here in McHenry County. We have the WPPC, the Wildlife the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee. Um, many of these organizations have native plant sales where you can buy plants basically at a wholesale rate in plugs, which is as big a plant as you ever need for most purposes. There are a few things it's worth spending the money to buy a gallon, but, um, but you can buy them from these organizations. And they're networking organizations. The, the best way to learn about gardening is from a gardener. So if you're walking down the street, driving down the street, and you see a, a landscape, and say, oh, that's, that's that native stuff they're talking about. Go knock on the door. You know, I mean, wear a mask. When you see somebody out in their yard, talk to them. You know, I've had people ask me, you know, do you ever have leftover plants? And I said, well, yeah. And so, you know, I've got one guy, you know, right now who, when I'm editing, when I'm removing things that are, there's, I've got too much of, I just send him a text, and he swings by and throws them in the trunk of his Camry and takes them home. You know, because really, you can get a lot of these plants from other native gardeners. But I really think the best resource is is other gardeners. Um, and there's getting to be more and more of them. You know, you don't have to be perfect, you know, by any means. You know, I, I look at my yard, and I always see what's wrong with it. But you need to have that kind of approach to where, you know, you're always willing to remove plants because if it just looks like a mess, then other people are going to come to the conclusion that native plants are a mess. And that's not helping. We try to take steps in, with our front yard to make it to where when people see it, they, 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 and a lot of this is explained pretty well in Planting in the Post-Wild World, how to, how to make it to where it's comfortable. We are as a species, we're adapted to, you know, wanting to look out over a landscape and be able to identify what's out there and know that there isn't something that's going to jump out of the bushes and eat us, you know. And when we don't know that, we're uncomfortable. And you don't want to make people uncomfortable with your landscape. You want it to be simple in many ways so that people can understand it we have two sides of the front yard. The one that you see pictures of on, on the Instagram is the more complex side. And it, it doesn't make people completely comfortable. The other side is a little, a little more well-defined. Um, having certain big features makes people comfortable because you see a tree, you know what a tree is. So try to make things, keep things simple, design in swaths of, of colors, and make it pretty. Because the thing is, what we can do with native plants, compared to what we've gotten used to with the poodle cut shrubs and the manicured lawn, which is so sterile, it's just really kind of sad, we can create so much beauty, you know, and you, you want to be able to look at your landscape and just take a deep breath, feel your blood pressure go down. You know, if, if the green carpet does that for you, I don't know what to say, because it doesn't do it for me but a, a, a nice, complex tapestry, you know, think in terms of a, an oriental rug that, you know, from a distance you see the whole pattern, the shape of, you see right away, you know there's something there that, that is artistic and is pretty. And then as you get closer and closer, you see more and more and more complexity. And that's the kind of thing we can do with these landscapes. The big takeaway from that, I would say, is luckily these native plants are used to living in this type of environment, used to living in the soil here for the most part. So they're able to multiply pretty quickly and spread. So it's not just like you're buying one plant. You're getting something, you're investing in it. Over a couple seasons, it will start spreading. You know, if someone sees your landscape, your native landscape, and say, hey, where'd you get that plant from? Um, I've got 15 in pots in the backyard. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, you could just pot them up, give it to your neighbor, give it to whoever was interested, and, and there you go. It's spreading again. So I think that's the great thing about it is that native landscaping, I would say, if you go to these plant sales, get them wholesale. It's it's comparable in price to a traditional landscape. So we're, you know, we're not asking you to spend more money on oh, no. plants. I think it's in fact, I think I would say less money because you're oh, not, you're, it, it should be, it should be less money yeah. because you're paying wholesale 
which is a good thing. Yeah. I, I like that. I enjoy that about it. And you're giving back to the ecosystem as well. And the water thing, by the way, the that front yard, we water that on average about once every other year. It just doesn't need, you know, we, we have regular enough. Here in northern Illinois, we have regular enough rains. Sometimes if we happen to go into a dry spell, you know, there might be something that blooms that only blooms for a week instead of three weeks because it, the plant was stressed. And that's, that's you know, unfortunate. And if a week and a half ago I was looking at my landscape and saying, you know, this might be that one one year out of, out of two or three when we water. We might water here within the next week or two. But we've gotten several rains since then. And so, yeah, you don't need water if, if you have an existing irrigation system that's fine they have off switches i think it was 2010 or 11 we had a drought year a yes. bad drought year yes and i saw a talk the next year by a guy who um was an irrigation specialist for davy tree you know which is a national company and they've got some really talented people who work for that company and he was the guy who, when people really had problems with their landscapes related to irrigation, he's the guy they call. He travels all over the country. And he did a talk the following year, and he said, most of the situations that I dealt with this year, when I got there and figured out what was going on, how I fixed their problem was I told them to turn their irrigation off because they were so freaked out about how hot and dry it was that they were just drowning everything and you know root plant roots need two things they need well they need nutrients from the soil but they need water and they need oxygen and if you keep all the pores in the soil full of water then there's no room for oxygen and the plants suffer there are very few plants that can survive without oxygen to their roots there are some um, they're they're called wetland plants. But yeah, this guy he, he went around the place, you know, and, you know, people were running their irrigation, you know, twice a day, and he said, let's try running this once a week. Everything was better. So most landscapes don't need near as much water as we give them. If they if a water, if a place does need a lot of irrigation, chances are you're growing the wrong plants. There is a misconception that our deep native deep rooted prairie plants are accessing deep water it's there's no science behind that they, they get their water from pretty much the top six 18 inches of the soil just like most of the trees do trees do most of their feeding most of their watering in the top 18 inches of the soil so this deep rooted business is about other resources getting nutrients from deep down and 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 energy storage also going back to the traditional <laughs> landscape and what we just talked about with the water inputs, the good thing about native plants, like I said before, is that they're used to the amount of water we, we receive here every year. This is the climate they are used to, they adapted to over you know millions of years, hundreds of millions of years to live here in the Midwest. So when you think that it's dry or that there's a drought or you might need to water them a little bit, but day-to-day -day basis, there's not a lot of worry with water because they are used to receiving this amount of rainfall. Um, they've been adapted to it. The input again with when you're watering your lawn, it's you're going to put more water into your lawn, into your nice green lawn than you will into a native landscape. So that's another good thing when we're talking about water scarcity issues, when we're talking about diverting water from natural sources. So I think that's a good thing as well. So I guess I'm going to ask the next question is, are you optimistic about the future of landscaping when it comes to the eco in regards to like the ecological side of it and then traditional landscape like how can we get people on board to get to ecological landscaping to get to native landscaping will it be you know i hope it's not an environmental catastrophe i hope it just you know spreads naturally and organically and more people i'll see more natives but how do you think it's going to happen well, I think our greatest tool for, for creating this change is beauty. We need to try to create these landscapes just as beautifully as possible. But also education is huge. Doug Tallamy recently put out a new book, 
and before everything got shut down, he was, you know, on a basically on a book tour. He said that um, that consistently, you know, and, and Doug he, Doug Talmy put out his first book, I believe, in two thousand seven. Um, Do you care to name these books? Yeah, the first one was Bring Nature Home, which is you have to read Bring Nature Home. Yes. It, it 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 just gets you started. Right. It's it's a great starting point. I didn't read it until I'd been at this for a while, mm-hmm. and a lot of things that I'd figured out on my own, boy, I should, could have saved myself a lot of work um, by just reading that book because he's really spelled it out. And the new one, there, he has another one called The Living Landscape that he wrote, co-wrote with a, a guy named Rick Dark um, that's also excellent. It, it, it explores the concept of layers, which is a very important concept, um, vertical layers, horizontal layers temporal layers and the transitions between, you know, the ground cover and the shrub layer and the small trees and the taller trees and the canopy trees and and how the transitions between them provide a lot of ecological services. But then his new book is called Nature's Best Hope. I will, you know, spoil alert if you don't want to know what Nature's Best Hope is, you know, plug your ears right now because Nature's Best Hope as far as Doug's concerned, is people. Um, because what people can do on their own piece of property. Um, and, but when, when Doug, and he just put that out this past spring, and when he started going out doing talks, he's been on the road. I mean, he, he teaches at the University of Delaware, but he travels a lot. He stays pretty busy, but when Nature's Best Hope came out, people who were booking him to do talks couldn't find rooms big enough for the tickets that they were selling, for the demand. So there is a lot more interest. Um, Sarah McHale with the Land Conservancy here in McHenry County, she did a Zoom uh, webinar on the process of converting her backyard from grass to prairie. And she figured, you know, they have a Zoom limit of 100 people. And she figured she'd probably get 20 people or so who'd be interested in this. She had to book, I think, eight sessions, um, which means 800 people from all over the United States took an interest in this and registered to participate. Yeah, so there is reason for optimism. People are taking an interest. I think that, you know, I know a lot more people have made comments. We have a lot more walkers in our neighborhood with the shutdown. And people, you know, I haven't gotten anybody to bite yet as far as, you know, well, we can come over and do this at your house. I say that all the time. But uh, nobody's bitten yet, but a lot lot more people have expressed interest. That's that's very, very encouraging to hear something like Sarah's Zoom meeting. I got so many people interested it's so encouraging and you know for the most part you see these articles about animals going extinct and i work you know outdoors every day and i see sites that are just completely you know overridden with invasive species and it just seems like you know almost like a not like a lost cause but it's pretty defeating when you see that and just to hear something like that something like doug talamy's nature's best hope bringing in so many interested people that's a great thing. That really makes me happy. And I will definitely link out to all the books that were mentioned in this podcast. They will be in the description on YouTube. If anybody's interested in reading these books, buying them. I read the same books as Ken, and I'm a big fan of them all. I would suggest anybody that is remotely interested in native landscaping and saving um, the species that we have here and the ecosystem that we have here to read those books. You talk about, well, these plants are adapted to this climate. Well, the climate's changing. But, you know, and I don't mean to dismiss climate change by any means, but climate has, you know, we've had, we have a two, three-year drought, and it's a major catastrophe. You know, in the last few thousand years, we've had droughts that lasted decades, and these ecosystems have rebounded. They're resilient. And these plants, you know, their ancestors have been through a lot of stress. They're really well adapted, and our rainfall patterns are changing, absolutely. Our temperatures are increasing, but we do have the resilience. 
you know, in, in the in within the genomes of these plants, the resilience is built in there. Because I have people tell me, well, with climate change, there's no such thing as native. No, you know, these things are tough, and they they are the things to use. If you will go to my YouTube channel, it's called Ken's Hort, K E N Z H O R T. There are two pieces on there. There's more coming, but near the end. Um, at the end of both of them, and the, the, there's one that's just kind of an over overview, and the other one is specifically about of covering ground. At, bo at both of them, it, it shows a picture of a part of our, our bookcase with a, a, a number of different resources. Obviously, follow Ken at, at Ken's Hort, K-E-N-Z-H-O-R-T, if you want to just talk about what are you currently working on now, I guess what I heard earlier was that you are attracting a lot more birds in your yard. It is amazing the things that you told me before. If you could just explain that to the listeners right now. Yeah, it's funny because we've had bird feeders up. We have four-foot eaves on our house, and so we just hang bird feeders from the eaves outside of the windows because you can hang them in such a way that the squirrels, except for the young squirrels, um, every every generation you'll get one or two really acrobatic ones who can do the move and they can come off the rain gutter and slink around in, underneath there and get to our feeders but you know they they age out pretty fast and can't do that move anymore so to save us bird seed we we you know we've had birds birds feeders and we've had birds but in the past I built a deck on the back of the house last year and we put a platform feeder out which makes the squirrels happy, but it also brought in a different diversity of birds than we'd ever seen before, and it changed the dynamics, just having a different kind of feeder in the yard. And now that we have the deck, we spend a lot more time sitting outside, and I don't know how much of it is our awareness of it, but I remember five years ago, when we would hear a, a wren, it would be an exciting, you know, oh, Christine would get very excited, you know, oh, maybe it'll come to the wren house I put out, you know, and now... I see wrens, I never go an hour without seeing a few wrens. And you've probably heard wrens in the background on this recording. I mean, they're just chattering all over the place because there are things for them, you know. Yeah, we put out bird feeders, but they eat bird seed as a last resort, except for the finches. Finches don't eat insects. They eat they eat seeds. Most of these other birds, and doves, the same thing. Uh, most of them, they live on insects, and every once in a while they'll eat they'll eat some seeds, but... For the most part, they're eating insects, and so the more activity, insect activity you have, and the more native plants you have, the more activity you're going to have, and and then you're going to have more birds. And and um, you know we've seen baby Orioles this year. We've seen all kinds of babies. It's they're just so goofy when they're young. Um, they just don't know. You know we we had a a chickadee sitting eating out of a feeder three feet from Christine this morning, and that has to be a youngster. The adults just aren't that stupid. It's pretty funny. We, we've watched a male cardinal with this bird that didn't really look like a cardinal sitting on the wire just a few feet from a bird feeder, and the cardinal was flying over to the feeder, getting seeds, coming back to the wire, feeding them to this other bird. And through something Christine found online, we realized that this was... A cowbird. Um, cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And whereas the cardinals from that nest had all, you know, were off, all, all off in the bushes fending for themselves, this cowbird, <laughs> you know, is just sitting on the wire waiting for Dad to feed him. Um, it was, you know, we, we saw that happen a few times before we figured out what it was, you know. Well, that isn't a cardinal. No wonder that doesn't look like a cardinal. The beak isn't right. Yeah. You know, because you don't expect the color to be right, but it just wasn't right. So, so That's a silly story, but <laughs> it just goes to show how if you change one thing in your landscape, even if it's one little thing such as a platform feeder or just planting a nice little garden of natives, it could really change the diversity, the, the your landscape, how, you know, how welcoming it is to native species. And, and that's the good thing about it is, is, you know, you make these little changes every little season and then you're encouraging more native species to come here 
and and breed and reproduce and that's what really helps the ecosystem as a whole so um, that's why it's so important to bring ecological landscaping and using natives in your landscape so thank you for your time here today thank you so much for speaking um, like i said you can follow him at ken's hort k-e-n-z-h-o-r-t i will be linking out to that in the description box on youtube and on instagram today well you're very welcome melissa it's always a pleasure thanks for asking me Appreciate it.